Okay, so this is a, um, I, I enjoyed reading the paper. It's a serious and very carefully constructed paper. Um, I think you can see that from the attention with which Mordecai uh, calibrates the uh, various parameters and his, his discussion of uh, how to choose what points to emphasize and, and what not. Uh, so uh, I just quickly uh, overview the model. So the, the key elements are um, a, a new Keynesian model with uh, price and wage Calvo type frictions and a, and a zero lower bound. The emphasis is on looking at deep recessions. He's added these additional uh, delever deleveraging features, uh, which are uh, kind of imposed from uh, outside the formal model, but uh, are very well motivated. Uh, the solution technique uses the rational beliefs or d diverse expectations approach rather than rational expectations, although there's a lot of, uh, uh, as Mordecai was saying, that may not be uh, um, central to some of the main policy points. Uh, they're inside the economy. There are two sub-economies, uh, one at the zero lower bound, one not. Um, the focus is really on the policy issues, the policy response to the Great Recession. And the policy is uh, what he calls a stabilizing wage policy, which is to raise uh, real wages. Uh, some further uh, details of the integrated model. Uh, so uh, this is in uh, uh, is section one of the paper. So section one is a formal uh, model, and section two is the artificial uh, depression and the uh, policy response. Uh, so the the model is, uh, I think it's uh, seven equations given. Uh, in uh, first order form on, uh, on uh, page 15 of the paper. He put up some of them uh, during, the, during the presentation. Um, so but, so it's, a, it's an elaborated New Keynesian type model. Um, the, um, uh, there are uh, uh, rational uh, beliefs about productivity and discount factor variables uh, in which the uh, uh, Agents uh, add in; they, they get right the empirical distributions of the of the exogenous shocks, but add in uh, correlated belief adjustments. Uh, there's this transition between an upper and lower uh, sub-economy that's uh, based on a two-state Markov process. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And he solves it both with uh, rational expectations and uh, rational beliefs. Uh, I think I skipped over uh, this particular point, but uh, some some. Features of the model are that uh, he's got sticky wages and uh, prices, and what that means is that there can be uh, inefficient and involuntary unemployment. So, of course, the plain vanilla New Keynesian model has uh, sticky prices, the flexible wages, and there really is no unemployment uh, in the model. Um, the uh, this is a model in which uh, there are four quarter real wage scales that depend only on productivity for regular employees. Uh, there are regular and irregular employees, so there still is a feedback from unemployment to wages and inflation. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's relatively small. Um, so then, then I should mention this, this rational beliefs approach uh, does give some role for autonomous beliefs, which is a common point uh, with the adaptive learning and behavioral approaches, um, which uh, 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 you know, essentially, rational expectations kind of shuts down the, the autonomous role of expectations. Uh, and so that's one of the features uh, I, I like about rational beliefs. Um, so the, I have some questions about uh, section one um, before I go uh, move on to section two. Uh, when the model is actually simulated, so these rational beliefs uh, are about this uh, some uh, shifts to the to the to the uh, uh, stochastic process of the economy, and it wasn't entirely clear when the model was simulated under rational beliefs uh, what the actual shifts driving the economy were. Uh, so I, I thought that wasn't uh, so clear. Uh, another point which I found not as clear as I liked is on what moves the <coughs> the crash variable, this Markov variable, in the formal model in part one. Uh, is, it, is it driven by the exogenous processes or not? If it's driven by them, it's not clear why. 
uh, if the, uh, unless, it's, if, unless you're really looking at exogenous processes which are sufficient to drive it all the way to the zero lower bound, necessarily. Uh, it, it could be that it's just, uh, I, you know, this is a question about how the model was solved. If, in part one, um, there are actually two different steady states in the model that are perfect foresight steady states. So one at the zero lower bound, one not. So it could be that it's purely an exogenous process, and so that this is effectively a sunspot equilibrium. Um, so uh, I don't want to dwell on this point, and I'm, I, I, I'm sure Mordecai can respond to that after I've finished. Um, anyway, that wasn't, that wasn't clear to me in part one of the paper. Uh, and notice that the output mean in the lower sub-economy in the, in the paper is, is only about 1% below. Uh, so that tells you that it's not actually fluctuations between the upper and summer uh, sub and the lower uh, sub-economy uh, from uh, normal random draws of the distribution that is giving you the depression, uh, but it's really the exogenous shocks themselves. Um, so let's go to section two. So section two is where Mordecai generates his artificial de de uh, depression, and then he considers. Uh, what happens with or without policy. So um, the, it's simulated by having a, uh, a crash in 2007. It's modeled specifically as these unanticipated discount rate shocks. Uh, those decrease aggregate demand. Those lead to deflation. That leads to the zero, zero lower bound binding. Uh, so then Mordecai also builds in uh, this deleveraging, which is it kind of comes from outside the model, but it's very plausible. It basically says, look, you've got real estate, but more importantly, stock prices. Uh, those did collapse during 2007. Uh, agents needed to rebuild their assets. Let's, let's just insist that they actually do that. And so there's this, uh, there's this uh, deleveraging rate, which is imposed. Uh, and uh, um, um, this, somewhere there's a red dot here. No. Okay. Splat L. Splat L? <laughs> okay. I can do splat L. Now what do I do for the red dot? Splat something else? <laughs> anyway. Um, uh, so then the uh, deleveraging process is, is, uh, is, is added on. Okay, so the policy results are dramatic. Um, an active uh, stabilizing wage policy greatly reduces the size and the length of the, of the depressions. Uh, and um, in fact, uh, as he notes, that uh, uh, without the policy, it's even possible that you never get out because the deflation increases the real value of the debt. So without the policy, in some cases, the length of the depression could be infinite. Let me briefly then compare to uh, other approaches to uh, the ZLB and severe recessions. So from the rational expectations point of view, uh, Eggerson and Woodford uh, initially pointed out that uh, you could get into the zero lower bound from something like a, uh, uh, a discount factor shock. Uh, and they argued uh, from a policy point of view that uh, one way to get around this was to have a commitment to monetary policy to stay at the zero lower bound after the shock has finally ended. Um, related policy uh, recommendations uh, have been to increase the inflation target. Um, and um, then more recently, Eggerson and Whitford have uh, talked about modeling the shock as a credit spread shock, which is uh, perhaps uh, um, more intuitive uh, given what actually happened. Uh, that end with a particular hazard rate each period, which sounds like a, a, an implausible uh, way to, to model shocks to me, but anyway, that's what they did. But, and the main thing is they show that the fiscal policy in these situations, under rational expectations, could be quite effective. Uh, so then, from the adaptive learning point of view, uh, in papers with uh, uh, Aaron Guzzi and Seppo Honkapolia, and then in a more recent paper with uh, Jess Benaviv, the first paper has a kind of one step ahead Euler equation learning point of view. The paper with Jess Benefit has a uh, Preston or Giuseppe Preston style infinite horizon learning point of view. Uh, we replace adaptive learning with adaptive expectations. And what we find is that um, 
a, a pessimistic shock that's sufficiently large to expectations can push you into a deflation trap that leads to falling inflation and falling output over time. And our basic point there is that even after the causal shocks are gone, expectations can remain a big problem. If the causal shocks have led to falling uh, output and inflation, you take the shocks away and expectations are still being influenced by the data, it is possible uh, to get into a deflationary spiral. Uh, and, um, and so, um, the, and, and, and one way to put this is that the targeted steady state is locally but not globally stable under learning. Um, and our recommendations uh, were for an aggressive temporary fiscal stimulus. We're thinking of an increase in government spending for a fixed period of time, finite period of time. It can be uh, financed by uh, taxes, or if you, record, uh, you assume recording equivalents, it's the same thing. Uh, there's a, a demand effect uh, that is uh, sufficient. If you do this on a sufficient scale, uh, it will get you out of your problems. Uh, so actually, let me show you the picture from Benavid uh, Schmidt-Groy Rebay. Nope, not from there. It's from Benavid Evans and Hunkapoya. This is the targeted steady state. That's the unintended steady state that Benavid Schmidt-Groy Uribe uh, emphasized and pointed out. These are the expectational dynamics under learning. You can see that the targeted one is locally stable, but if you had an expectation to inflation and output, that's uh, sufficiently far away, then there are these divergent paths. And these are the ones which I think you're discovering in the experimental talks, where it tends to go off to those very small numbers. Um, so uh, uh, in, in more recent, uh, in, in uh, recent work with uh, Seppo and Koshik uh, Mitra, uh, we've, uh, uh, added in consumption and output, I'm sorry, uh, consumption and inflation lower bounds. Um, and if you do that, then you actually develop a third steady state, which we call a trap, a stagnation trap steady state. So now you've got the targeted steady state, you've got the unintended steady state, which is not locally stable under learning, you've got these deflation traps, but you wind up settling in the stagnation steady state. Uh, again, we recommend fiscal policy. Fiscal policy can get you out, but it may have to be on a big scale, especially if you wait too long. Okay, so anyway, uh, so there's Mordecai's set up. There's a rational expectations policies prescriptions involving uh, either monetary policy or fiscal policy under adaptive learning. Um, uh, the situation is what, we, what I just described. So let's go back to Mordecai now. So the key mechanism of this of his policy, which he very clearly laid out, I thought, uh, yeah, five minutes, okay, is that the effect of real wage stabilization uh, uh, it works through inflation. Uh, so uh, at first blush, you might think it's redistribution. No, it's not that. It's it's through. There may be some effect there, but that's not the main effect. It's through inflation, and uh, in fact, all of the literatures that I've just described. Make, do make that uh, the, the key consideration, and I think that's now uh, very well understood. In his setting, real wages leads to uh, firms to want to, higher real wages leads firms to want to set uh, higher prices, and hence it leads to higher inflation. If you're at the zero, zero lower bound, that leads to lower real interest rate, that stimulates uh, demand. That's, that's the mechanism, and it seems entirely right. Uh, so I have a few methodological questions and then some, uh, so, you know, basically I'm, a, I'm on board with all this. I have some methodological questions and I have a few uh, policy issues that, uh, to discuss. So uh, one question was how much the results rely on uh, rational beliefs versus rational expectations. I think Mordecai answered that in his talk, which has said that, uh, that uh, you, you could do uh, all of the key points that he makes in this particular paper. Uh, with rational expectations and rational belief, which is kind of added on because it helps fit the, the data on, say, expectations and volatility. Um, my main concern methodologically is that with rational beliefs, as with rational expectations, there, there, I'm concerned about stability under learning. So the figure I just showed you, there still is that second equilibrium at the zero lower bound, which is not stable under learning. And I think that will be true with, I, I see no reason for that not to be true with rational beliefs as well as rational expectations. 
So I think um, but in models that have a zero lower bound, the stability issue under learning is acute. And that this disequilibrium uh, deflation trap mechanism may also be present in the rational beliefs framework and in, and in Mordecai's uh, model. Um, however, uh, I have no reason to think that uh, if you did adaptive learning and you took on board this, uh, this uh, uh, deflation trap uh, disequilibrium process, uh, that uh, wage policy wouldn't work there as well. So um, I've got a minute. I can do the policy discussion then. Okay, so uh, I basically, I, I completely agree with Mordecai that, um, that high unemployment and low aggregate output uh, in the United States over the 2009-2014 period was inefficient and it reflected an aggregate demand failure. And in my view, U.S. monetary policy has been brilliantly aggressive during this period uh, and it likely prevented a depression. In my view, fiscal policy was, was woefully inadequate. Uh, QE and the, and the various uh, extended monetary policies that were used were appropriate given that lack, but a larger fiscal stimulus would have been uh, very appropriate, it was very needed, it was really uh, a depressing fact from my point of view that it wasn't done on a bigger scale. Fiscal policy operates directly on demand and employment and then indirectly on inflation expectations. Uh, Mordecai's recommendation is for a wage policy. Okay, that would work more directly on inflation and indirectly on output and employment. Um, I see practical drawbacks to both approaches. Uh, to uh, fiscal policy, it's political resistance to either government spending or, or debt. It wouldn't have to be to debt if you finance this by taxes. It works just as well with taxes, uh, or it continues to work with taxes. Um, but I guess there are also practical difficulties to a stabilizing wage policy, which would be compliant, enforcement, and uh, some inefficiencies dictated by relative wages being out of, out of whack. Um, so anyway, uh, so it's a provocative paper. I agree with a great deal of it. Uh, I share Mordecai's skepticism concerning the adequacy of QE and things like forward guidance. Uh, I'm also a little bit nervous from an adaptive learning point of view about things like raising inflation targets. Uh, Bill and I have addressed that in a paper. Uh, and. Uh, so my last comment will be, uh, again, to remind you, I think this is a very serious and carefully constructed paper. It looks to me like the issues in the paper are still very relevant uh, for a lot of the Euro area.